basically go out, wear some fancy shoes and we'll all be all right. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gemma Kearney. I'm in my house, which is filled with stuff, many, many objects, and these are the objects that make my life. Though, it was hard to choose, I'm not gonna lie. So I'm gonna show you some of my most favorite things. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I wrote a foreword for a book called Feminism Is, a guide to the history, the current day, the terms of what feminism means in modern times, which I think is constantly changing. So it's always good to have a go-to guide. Where shall I start? I love shoes. I have a sort of perversion for shoes, to be honest. <laughs> I could almost eat them. Um, I mean, look at these. They look like glamorous sweets or something. Something like Willy Wonka would make if he made shoes. They're from a designer called Terry de Havilland, who I talk about a lot, who I love dearly. He's a friend of mine and he made shoes back in the 70s and still makes them bespoke today. And, I mean, they are so 70s. He, he claims that he can't remember much of that era because he was on psychedelics, which <laughs> made for good shoes, as far as I'm concerned. And just the colourway makes me so happy. And because they're wedged, they're quite comfy. I didn't realise when I was younger how much colour and sparkle and, and exuberance when it comes to dressing and how I express myself how important it was to me until I was a, sort of becoming a woman and, and people asked me about it and people were shocked by the way I dress or would compliment me or sort of deem me as a certain type of person. But I, I have thought about it and on reflection, it is a political statement to be bright, to make people smile and to challenge. And I wish more people did it. I just wish that it was normal to wear a rainbow jumper and Terry de Havilland shoes. And I just wish that we could be a bit freer, to be honest. I mean, you are who you are. Some people are brilliant at being minimalists and I admire those people very much. <laughs> but I, I hope that I'm okay at being loud. <laughs> okay, so this, when I was in my early 20s, not knowing what the hell was gonna go on with my career, I was an assistant to a stylist called Cynthia Lawrence John, who is a great when it comes to British fashion and being. Uh, a, 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 just a, a pioneer of putting together amazing outfits and really having a narrative when it comes to fashion. And she took me to a show for a designer called Ashish and I had never heard of him. And I went to this London Fashion Week show. I couldn't believe that I was allowed in. I was this gangly, early 20s, like wide-eyed assistant and this was the final piece. Every single piece had been like completely made of sequins, which is Ashish's signature style, uh, which I've since come to know uh, over like 10 years. And um, this was the finale dress. And I remember looking at it and being like, oh my God, jaw dropped. Like, imagine being able to wear this. I was just like, Imagine just being able to put on a mermaid tail and just waltz around in it. Like, that's what my dreams are made of. It just really set my imagination on fire and I, I thought it would be my dream to own that dress one day. And then a few years later, I was at a sample sale and it was for sale um, for under £500. And I was like, because <laughs> it was worth a lot more than that. And even though I didn't have very much money, I thought, Rent or a she's dress of dreams? A she's dress of dreams. <laughs> and I haven't looked back because I love wearing it and I wear it for very special occasions and when I feel truly happy. And there's even a picture of me wearing it in a bath. And then I feel a real mermaid. I am a dream chaser. I'm a massive dreamer. I'm in my own head and imagination a lot. I live by the sea and I look at a vast expanse and I know brilliantly minded people and I've traveled the world and gone beyond in terms of experience what I ever would have expected. I live quite a dramatic life really. I mean, even in the way that I dress, but I, and I don't mind that. It means that I live big and um, I think chasing your dreams is a wonderful thing to do with your life. Like do it, why the hell not? And like loads of things go wrong, loads. 
If you live big, your heart breaks big. Ugh, but it's cool that way. Okay, so the skeptics and the intellects that I know roll their eyes at my slightly hippy dippy nature, but I can't help it. I just love nature and I like things and I do like a crystal. I know my fellow crystal lovers will not roll their eyes, but many people will. And I like them when they have integrity, not just for the sake of it. I mean, I'm a hopeful optimist and I, I love the idea that I could go down to the shop, down the road, like I did when I was 12, and get a tiny stone in a little uh, Hessian bag and then it would change my life. Um, but I'm a realist too. Um, so I kind of collect crystals when they feel right to buy and they'll remind me of a place. I got this gigantic chunk of a thing, which is a rose quartz, when I was in Hay on Wai at the Hay Festival, which is an amazing literary festival. I've been working there, and there's this really old school druid looking shop with a guy that looks like a wizard at, <laughs> at, the, uh, at the counter, and he had some fossils in there, and it, it was cool. And, um, there was something about the surroundings and the setting and all of the literary events that I'd been to that made me feel quite sort of esoteric. So buying this gigantic, which I think is like a heart, weirdly, um, piece of rose quartz made sense. And um, some would say it protects your heart or enhances an openness to love. Others would say it's just taking up space on your shelf. But I really like it. And I like holding it sometimes because sometimes you just need to hold something that protects your heart, you know? But it's cool. And I do do little weird witchy things like take it to the sea and cleanse it. But it depends on how into stuff like that you are. But it's one of my faves because it's like big. It's not like dainty and ooh, like ooh. It's like, yeah, it's like a weapon as well. <laughs> I came across this book recently and it's a special publication of a poem by Maya Angelou called Life Doesn't Frighten Me. And the reason why I love it is because it's illustrated throughout um, with Jean-Michel Basquiat illustrations. So the words and the pictures have this beautiful synergy. There is something about profound, abstract, poetical, black artists that I have so much affinity and sort of resonance with. And um, Maya Angelou is one of my complete, complete, complete idols. Recently, I was trying to look up women of colour that have not ended their legacy in tragedy. I already knew about Maya Angelou and her poems, but reading about how full her life was and how she got over trauma and how much output she had in terms of poetry, writing, script writing, journalism, singing, all sorts. It was really inspiring and I, she, I sort of become a student of hers now. I'm like obsessed. And then I came across this because I love Jean-Michel Basquiat. This poem is about uh, life not frightening you at all, even if you come across monsters and scary things and it kind of helps you hone into the good stuff that you've got. Like I've got a magic charm that I keep up my sleeve. I can walk the ocean floor and never have to breathe. Like you're, you're a superhero basically. And it's, and it's basically for children, but I'm, I am a child. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I definitely need a motto regularly that life doesn't frighten me. It can be from intrepid exploring to getting on a stage in front of hundreds of people. I, I presented the Artist Manager Awards recently. So there was the whole music industry, like a lot of men in suits, basically, getting drunk in front of me. And I told them what's what in a tuxedo. <laughs> Life doesn't frighten me moment, though I was terrified. But I have those a lot. <laughs> or jumping into the sea. Like I swim in the sea in the winter. Um, again, it gives you this sense that it's gonna be all right. Because if you don't die when you get in the sea in December, should be okay. <laughs> Next up, um, my berets. I mean, it's really quite um, strange to bring up something that like is your product, I think maybe, but like I love them. I, like, I, I, they're a collaboration that I did. I 
sort of co-designed them with a, an amazing, exquisite fashion designer called Mary Benson. And she embellishes things and we've worked together before, like with normal, boring bits of clothing and she has kind of customised them to my dream. So that's something that we did personally. Like, for example, I went to the Brit Awards years ago. I had a big black skirt and I said, can you cover it in gold sunflowers? And she did. And we did the same with berets. We used to put statements on them and so, like symbols or if my friend was working on a play, so we got the play name written all over it in iridescent letters. And I said to her, why don't we just bring out these berets? Like, let's put out positive statements on our heads. We'll give 5% of the profits to Young Minds Charity and um, it'll be fun. And then we went on a journey because we decided to source vintage berries as there's a lot of landfill when it comes to fashion and uh, a lot of dodgy stuff going on with mass production. So we sourced 500 vintage berries that we upcycled. So they're all different colours and um, you can get different statements on them. And it's been so fun. So this is I Believe in Magic. This is Lover Not a Hater. This is It's Gonna Be Better Than Okay. Uh, you Are Beautiful. And that's it, they're the four statements, but there are so many colours. And I like them because obviously you can tell I like colourful things. I also love a berry because I like to feel like I spend most of my time in some sort of dimly lit cafe in New York where there are lots of joss sticks and People are reciting kind of black power poems and yeah, I would be wearing a beret if I was in there. So I, I've always liked a beret. Um, and I feel like these make people smile. I think being short and snappy does help activism. I think being bold helps activism. And I think I realized that I, I, have, I have activism running through my veins and I can't run away from it. Like, it would be nice to live a comfortable life and shut my eyes to everything. I kind of wish for that sometimes, <laughs> but I can't because of who I am and what I've experienced and what I see around me. So to be short and snappy and bold is a, is a help in a murky, hard time. <laughs> And that leads me on to my next object in a Lloyd Grossman style, who lives in a house like this. Um, I love this, I was drawn to it. It was from a vintage shop in Margate where I live, where there are a lot of old fairground lights and paraphernalia of all sorts from distant times of amusement and leisure. And this would have been hung up somewhere, I reckon probably in the 60s or 70s to direct you to find change so that you could use the slot machines or, or um, you know, like have fun in the, in the arcades. But for me, it was an arrow facing upwards and um, it's a beautiful retro font, which I really like. I'm a sucker for nostalgia, I can't help it, I can't help it. Um, it's just like, yeah, like change, <laughs> we need change. And we need it to be bright and we need it to be positive. So it's a cool object but it says something to me as well. Oh, there's so much to unpick in this tapestry of, uh, of current times when it comes to what we need to do for positive change, which is why it becomes so overwhelming, I think, and no one really knows what to do and we're all frazzled. I think like we're, like, we're switching off stuff. We're switching off our emotions and our buttons to, to, to horror, and I think that's not helping anyone. So I think positive change comes through communication and a tenderness which doesn't come through technology or very set stance of anger and fear. I think we need to soften. I think we're so conscious of everything. We're so conscious of judgment. We're so conscious of ticking boxes. We're so conscious of succeeding and money and status and numbers and likes and that doesn't sit with me. Like, it's not who I am. I, I like, live for a moment and uh, I can't be defined. And I, um, I like all sorts of people and I don't believe in segregation. So I think, I, I, I think if there's anything to be said about that, and that's quite wafty, it's just to like, I just try, even though it's exhausting, to just be myself and, and I think, that's how I live and that's why I like the things that I do.